is uh, Pam Washburn from Johnson Controls. Uh, she is going to share about the digital transformation and virtual selling transformation that the company went through in the last few months. Uh, it's a pretty fascinating story. Uh, Pam is a director of sales enablement at Johnson Controls. Uh, specifically, uh, she's in what they call the owner sales group, which means people who already own the existing Johnson Controls assets. And uh, it's a very relevant uh, story out here in terms of install based selling. With that, I am going to uh, stop my share and uh, give everybody about a minute. Pam, if you want to bring, your, uh, bring up your presentation, uh, I'm going to give everybody about a minute here to uh, take, a, take a quick uh, break if they want. Uh, and then maybe at uh, one, uh, two minutes past uh, the hour, maybe at uh, the bottom of the hour, maybe you can start a presentation. All right, I'll let you bring your Perfect. presentation until then. You can uh, bring up your presentation, Pam, while we're waiting. That'd be great. Hopefully, in fact, that, that works. We're seeing you, but we're not seeing your presentation yet. Oh, okay. I think you've got to switch. Uh, yep, you got to switch screens. Probably making. Yeah, I can see we, can, we can see Pam's screen. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, great. I'd say if anybody in the audience cannot see Pam's screen, uh, maybe let us know via the chat window. Okay, Pam, uh, let's, uh, let's get going. It's 12.32, which is, uh, we give people some break. Uh, I guess everybody, but I can see it right now, but uh, let's go on and we'll- uh, Okay, Vivek. Well, hey, Vivek, thank you so much for the introduction and the opportunity to share the Johnson Control story here today with this extended group of leaders. It has been a fascinating session. I thank you for the invite. I've taken a lot of great notes and nuggets um, from this panel of you know, experts that we all are learning from. So it's just been fantastic. And like everyone here, you know, though I'm sharing this story, there is a large number of my team members who I've worked alongside in partnership on this journey for us to achieve the progress I'm gonna share with you guys today. So with that, I'm gonna to jump to the next page here. Hopefully that works, it looks like it's moving. So again, I'm Pam Washburn. Uh, I am a two-year rookie at Johnson Controls. Uh, that's what I call myself. Um, but what's fascinating about this, I've spent most of my career in the healthcare industry, um, practicing you know, across various different channels, including commercial channels, service. Um, I've been almost in every different spectrum except uh, uh, I'll call it supply chain for the most part. They, they weren't able to pull me in. Um, you know, one of the things that I really love about sort of the organization I'm in now with Johnson Controls is that even though it's a completely new industry, um, the commercial challenges that, you know, everybody's been expressing, everybody's been sharing, they're real across all the multiple industries, and we saw them here. So the learnings that I was able to take from my prior experience have been very, very relevant with what I'm going to share here today. Um, along with that, um, you can see here I'm a big STEM uh, champion for young women. Um, I, I'm a big believer in that. And so, you know, by all means, if there's anyone on this, this call that's involved, uh, let me know and I'll join in your cause as well. So with that, let's get started. So a fun fact, and um, I'm going to have a little bit of a twist just because, you know, I, I love water and I love the boating. So there's a few of my colleagues on here as well who are boaters. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to share is like, did you know that large ships actually lean outward while taking a turn while small sh ships turn inward? So if you look at sort of the, the ship on the right, if you are sitting inside of a, a boat and I drive a pontoon, so think about that as somewhere between a ship and a, uh, an ocean liner. But if I'm driving the boat and my passengers don't turn with me and lean with me as I'm turning, they're going to potentially fall out of the boat. I'm going to leave them behind. But for any of us who've been on a cruise ship, and if you're walking on the boat and all of a sudden you feel the boat turn, you immediately go towards the wall. So all of a sudden you're smacked against the wall and you're wondering what's happening. And that's because of the outside forces that are happening. So you have a lot of different forces that are happening inside of the organization and outside of the organization 
That is what I'm gonna talk about a little bit here today. So with that, let's talk a little bit about our large ship of Johnson Controls. So we have a very large ship. Um, every day what we do is we transform environments where people live, they work, they learn and they play. We are in 90% of the world's most iconic buildings. We have a global team, so a very distributed conglomerate with about 100,000 experts that deliver on our customer missions in industries such as um, healthcare, education, data centers, and transportation. Um, we have more than 4 million customers globally, and our mission is really quite simple. We want to optimize building performance to improve safety and enhancing comfort for our customers. We are here to, as you can see on the bottom, power behind their mission. Um, we wanna make their goals our reality. And what you can see here on the upper left is, you know, we've got 130 years of innovation experience. So what that means is this organization has changed very dramatically, just like uh, John was talking about, even Tom and Remy. The organizations are changing legacy information, data, that comes along with many mergers and many, many divestitures. But what is it and how can you stitch that together? So that's where I'm gonna spend my time today talking a little bit about our journey and where we are in relation to um, our data and the install base journey we're on. So with that, we have a ship, I call it our ship of our sales and organization. So uh, Vivek hit on it. We have about 400 field-based uh, owner sales organ um, reps. We are focused on B2B sales, so direct, hand-to-hand -hand or human-to-human -human engagement. Um, we are across multiple verticals, uh, a number of them, different industries, and we meet with customers every day. We meet with them at their buildings. We are trusted advisors. We are experts. Um, they're very senior. They're very tenured. They, they know our product, they know the solutions, and they work with their customers to deliver that. Now, the process by which we do this is very structured. It's very complicated. It's complex. It's high, um, high, high complexity, as I just said, as well as um, it's a long cycle business. So as you think about this, a lot can go wrong uh, inside of an organization. So what the team has shared here, the other different panels, is you have to have a strategy. And we're really big believers in strategy here at the Johnson Controls organization. And sales and our customers are paramount. Our customers are our true north. So with that, I'm going to talk about sort of what's happened here. Here we go. So we're in our ship. It's fiscal year 20. We're driving along. We're, we're steering our, our boat. And lo and behold, a storm of the century is ahead of us. So the pandemic is coming at us. Um, I recall the first you know, bullet I had of sort of a pandemic was in early January, late December. And there was just some ripples that came over to the North America about what was happening abroad. But then very, very quickly, it's mid early March. And basically our North America organization was encapsulated in what you're seeing here. You know, jobless cases are rising. The Dow is closing down dramatically. Schools are closing. Buildings are closing. Even Disney World, you know, actually closed, um, which, you know, personal story, a friend of mine was actually supposed to be there. But those are the things that when that happens, you know, there was a lot of confusion. We didn't know. There was uncertainty. There was social distancing. We didn't know what to do with this human interaction that we needed. So now you hear our story of who we are as an organization. We're gonna to jump to a poll, and maybe you can help me, DJ. What would you do? What would you do if you were sitting in our organization running a sales team? So we've got a few options here. We're a leader, do we stay the course? Do we make some modest changes, or do we transform? The numbers are trickling in, Pam. So I'm just going oh, no, to Oh, no, great. For, it's great. Yeah, yeah. I'll give it a minute. So a uh, little bit of uh, some music here we can think through. Sure. Let's just wait for it to reach, you know, at least 50%. Perfect.
All right. I think we're at dot 50%. I'm going to end the poll in the interest of time and uh, okay. the numbers. So I love the feedback here. So most of you, yes, making the change to transform. Absolutely. Um, close here. It was our digital inflection point. So when you look at this ship, we needed to turn. We needed to change our course, plot a different course. And as an organization, this disruption, if we didn't pivot and we didn't position ourselves, we wouldn't be able to survive and thrive. So when I say survive, it's pivot for the short term to survive. And when, you, when we move to thriving, it's positioning ourselves for the longer term for our customers. This is where we wanted to go. This is our strategy that we wanted to put in place. So let's talk about what we needed to do. We needed to become more dynamic and more agile for our customers. So again, think of our very large Johnson Control ship, very large organization. I talked about our customers and I'll get to that, our rapid market. So again, our market was evolving very, very quickly. You know, we worked, as I mentioned, in the healthcare space, inside of manufacturing, retail, there was new markets that were jumping and rising up to the equation. And then our typical tried and true markets that we work in, our dominant ones, were actually having changes and shutdown. How could we respond? What could we do? We needed to be able to plan very quickly and respond very quickly with what we needed. We also needed to focus on our install base. So our life cycle focus. This is what the team and everybody here as the panelists are talking about. We had a number of assets and equipment that was out at our customers that we've left behind. And that takes me to where we get to customers for life. We needed to know our customers beyond that initial sale. So Tom hit on it very succinctly in that, you know, we know when we ship a piece of equipment, we know when we typically install the piece of equipment, we don't know who we're dealing with many times. We don't know who our contact is and we don't know what their needs are. Many times sales reps have to hunt and find and peck that. We call that our digital thread. We wanted to understand what was that digital thread for our customers from the time the equipment was installed. What service activity has been happening at that customer? What um, warranty information is available for that customer? Who are the contacts of that customer? What assets have they bought? Are they connected? What, what do they have here as far as service contracts? All of that information was disparate and was completely distributed across Excel, also never updated. So that for us was something we needed to really focus on. We needed to empathize on customer insights, right? So what customers were dealing with, we now needed to say, hey, this is what we originally were talking to you about. What is your immediate need now? So those were really present and really focused. Customers are our true north. But as we talked about people, processes, and systems, People are the backbone of what we have as an organization. So we needed to prepare them. We needed to give them tools and resources. We needed to drive transparency. And what was really big for us was driving a culture of empowerment. We have a very strong sales team, as I've talked about. We basically took off the reins of so much of headquarter touch and allowed them to pivot and make decisions local, real time, in order to meet their customer needs. So, even with this charted course, there were a ton of challenges, as you can imagine, right? We know where we needed to go, but, you know, were we going to be able to respond quickly? Again, it was moving so, so very fast. I, I shared about sort of the uncertainty in our dominant markets. These were where we spent our time. This is where we invested. This is what the team's talking about, where we focused our marketing and we focused all of our content and our messaging to those customers. Now we had to shift, shift, shift and pivot. There is true realization and supply chain risk that was part of our process. Sales reps didn't know what they were gonna have available for them. And then the information gathering, we talked about this, we needed to move digital. Our sales reps had to try and originally hunt and peck. And really what we wanted to do from this particular situation is really moved to the digitization. We needed to get to information more quickly and we couldn't go on a journey of five years. We couldn't go on a journey of two years. We needed to go on a journey of today. And that's what I'm gonna talk a little bit more about. So how did we do this? We plotted our digital path forward, okay? So for our team, 
we prepared them. So one of my favorite things, I did play basketball uh, at the university, so someone will find that out about me, but uh, I'm a big fan of who John Wooden is. So for those who don't know John Wooden, he is a famous collegiate basketball coach for the men's program at UCLA and achieved a lot of success uh, during a very, I'll call it, um, critical time, a very unrestful time um, in those days. And he was able to sort of really simplify processes to drive repeatable, executable, and success. And that's really what we focused on. So one of my favorite phrases is of his is, be quick, but do not hurry. And what that means is if we went too slow, we'd miss the market, we'd miss the opportunity, right? But if you went too fast, then you'd make too many mistakes. And in essence, you'd lose the trust of your sales reps. And Remy talked a lot about that. The sales reps needed to trust us. We needed to help them be successful. When it comes to um, virtual selling, that was something we did. Now, again, virtual selling, our friends in McKinsey, you know, they've done a survey. Most of the B2B organizations through this pandemic, I think it's over 90%, have taken on some form of virtual selling. That wasn't the only thing we did. We needed to provide them information and resources. That digitization and intelligence is so absolutely critical. We needed to be able to give them uh, data-driven information, customer-facing information, and then it really had to pivot. It had to unify our processes as well as what the customer was needing. That drove that intersection. In the past, again, what would have taken us years, we had to turn around in days, weeks, and months. Now, the other thing I wanted to highlight was our focus on customers. I use this phrase, and you'll hear this quite a bit, is, you know, we don't want to leave any customers behind. You know, so many times, you know, like Remy highlighted, they're out hunting. But there is a huge benefit to what the customer experience is and helping that customer succeed, being able to help them drive the solutions to be successful. You know, right now we have, you know, over 4 million customers globally. There's more than 150,000 customers in our organization. So match that up against 400 sales reps. It is absolutely impossible for them to have that kind of information readily available at their fingertips without a very strong artificial intelligence and digitization and platform that the team can use. We needed to be able to be ready for them, provide that information at their fingertips so they could find that digital thread of their customer and then go talk to their customer and help provide that solution. Be that true north, work with that customer to achieve that. That was absolutely critical. And then from last beat, but maybe not least, you know, we are big around leading from behind in our, in our organization, very focused on servant leadership. We really took sort of the hands off of the sales process. You know, so much has been um, put into sales operations and planning, you know, we best in class, you know, have, you know, centralize this, centralize this, know this, know this. We basically took those reins off and really pivoted to our team to say, you're empowered. You're empowered to make decisions. You're empowered to work with your customer based on their needs. And what we found was boundlessness innovation. We had new products, new customers, new things coming. And this is where we empowered our sellers to act. So I kind of let in here with where are we at with our summary. So we are, as I like to stay, steaming forward now with a strong tailwind, even in light of all the headwinds everyone is facing right now with this pandemic. In just a short blip here of about three months, our quoting activity has increased 72%. Our deal size has increased 135%. We're seeing win rates increasing, you know, in excess of 25%. I talked about hitting to non-traditional markets, finding our customers we have left behind and bringing them on and providing solutions for their needs and solving for their problems. We talked as well about digital tools. Again, Remy hit on it, team members here on the panel. If we, didn't, if we provide a tool that no one finds value in, they won't come back to it. They won't use it again. It will, provoke, it will erode trust. It will lead to unrest. And what we found with our tools and with our process with our team, we've been able to eliminate 
I'll call it years of sort of missteps of very large IT projects. We moved quickly, we pivoted, we were agile, and we went forward with the mantra that this data is not perfect. Even with intelligence and layering, we know that data is not perfect and we empowered our teams to help us enrich it. That was a big win. We gave them the trust they deserve and they were able to help us. So with that, you know, even with this strategy, you know, again, no strategy is perfect, but these challenges have given us uh, a great opportunity to go forward for our customers. We truly believe that we will not leave any customer behind. It is absolutely critical that we move forward with this continued strategy of nurturing our IB, using intelligence and digitization to make us better for our customers. I thank you for the time, um, for listening to our story. And with that, I think we'll turn it over to Vivek for some any further questions. Awesome, Pam. That was really, really good. And I think the point you made at the end about, you know, trusting the team to trust themselves and get the right data is really important. And I think somebody used the phrase democratizing data, and it's a very, uh, it's a very trite phrase people use, but that's also democratiz democratizing trust as well, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The people in the team can go ahead and start making those changes. So that's great. Hey, Amai, as always, uh, back to you for question answer and moderation. I noticed there's one question or one comment there for sure. I know you're getting some anonymous questions as well. You want to bring those up, please, Amai? Yep, absolutely. Um, so uh, the first question is actually around data. So uh, Pam, mm -hmm. even though you, know, you mentioned data is not perfect, how did you get your sales team to sort of trust and adopt these digital tools? Uh, it's not like you can just hand it to them and say, hey, you know, here's the keys to the car, go ahead and use it. How did you really, how did you really drive that adoption? So it's a great question. We actually, um, when we launched these tools, we actually did it more softly. So we actually um, allowed for people to opt in, as I like to say, and we created a whole process around opting in and success sessions, we called them. So we brought the team together to share best practices um, and create what I call actions for the team to go do. So we made it really easy for them. We gave them bite size actions that they could go in, look at warranty information, go look at customers who aren't under an agreement. All of those tools were easily you know, shown and then they were able to replicate it and then go out to their customers and then bring those solutions to them. So that was one thing that we really focused on. And then as well, again, just, I can't, you know, I just, it is so critical that we said, hey, the data is not perfect and we want your help to enrich it. So many times in many organizations, you're told you can't update data. Sales reps loved the fact that they could enrich information and make it their own. So that was a huge win for us uh, as we have gone through this journey. Really positive feedback around that as well. Great, thanks, Pam. And so the next question uh, from a LinkedIn user is, um, can you elaborate on how you changed your service sales strategy using this pivot? Yeah, so, you know, again, our, our, our strategy was, you know, around selling, you know, we really sort of doubled down on install-based selling. Because again, so much when you think about um, the environment we were in, which is here, you know, spending has been relatively um, cut, you know, where, where could we talk to our customers? Where were their biggest needs? There are people who still need to run their buildings. They still need to have service. They have challenges just like us where they cannot go in and access their building. So how could we help them provide those solutions? Those were the things that we really focused our team on. And then they came back after talking to their customers and that's where we innovated. We actually came up with further suggestions, further products, further solutions that we then shared across the team. And it just took on like, you know, I guess I'll say it grew, you know, like a wildfire. It just kept going where people were sharing and all the best practices were, were distributed amongst each other. It was done naturally, organically, not forced from sort of the headquarter down. So I think that was really, really essential for us. Um, and again, I think just being very open and communicating and helping them you know, get better as sellers. These were new muscles they needed to use. Virtual selling 
was something they were not very comfortable with. And we spent a lot of time making them very comfortable talking to a screen and not spending time face to face with folks. It is a very different um, challenge for a lot of our, our senior reps, but they were really on board. And then being able to, to then provide the information that they never had before. They just saw a whole new customer base open in front of their eyes that they never saw before. And that was the, that was the I call it the snap that got everybody engaged and really jumping on the program as well, our strategy. Thanks a lot for that, Pam. Um, and Vivek, I believe you said Carlos wants to ask a question. Yeah, Carlos, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, go ahead, Carlos. Hey, Pam, no, I've, I've absolutely loved uh, your conversation here. And I guess mine was similar to, you know, the sort of championing that was needed because obviously even 75% data accuracy is, you know, for a salesperson, not perfect. And they get what you called you wrote trust. Was there any level of cultural involvement that needed to make sure that, look, we still only have this much data, but that's got to get us somewhere. Was that ever part of the equation? Absolutely. Yeah, we were really open and honest around of the strategy um, and what information we had available. I, I hope so. Carlos, um, I would Pardon? Sorry, Vivek? Sorry, no, sorry, sorry. Oh, no. So one of the things I would say is we, we tried to be really forward with saying, hey, we're pulling together a lot of this information. And, and to be candid, um, I think there was just, I'll call it, um, the sales reps were a bit exhausted with the fact that they had to keep hunting so much on the pa in the past. So by creating this digital thread, and being able to uh, allow them to have less admin time and be able to see their customers right in front of them using our digital tools, it was phenomenal. Um, they, they appreciated it, even if it wasn't perfect. And what was really great is there was more competition amongst the team members to find information that wasn't accurate. Um, so they would you know, start to look at it and say, hey, this needs to be fixed. They would send, we'd, we'd keep it going. So, you know, they understood sort of the legacy of what we were dealing with, with what when came with the data. And, you know, honestly, um, because they didn't have to do it themselves and try and find it, they were on board of working with us on it and knowing that we were going to get better to keep going forward with their information. Fantastic. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about that too. Yeah, perfect. Fantastic. All right, Pam, I think we have time for one more question with this, quite a few. Okay. Um, what was the biggest problem you encountered as part of the digitization process um, while you were doing this transformation? Oh, well, I mean, I, the challenges I talked about, just sort of the pace and the necessity of how quickly we needed to move, um, I think that was sort of the unrest and the uneasiness. So. You know, I think that overlying sort of feeling as an organization was just really tough on everybody, but sort of the, the coming together and the culture of we are all here together and we're working through it, it brought us even closer together, which I think was, is really important. It just shows that culture is, you know, you can't, you can't buy culture, you can't create culture. It's something that is developed inside of an organization. And if you have a great culture, you're gonna survive, most likely. If you have a terrible culture, there's gonna be a lot of problems. I think our culture and really this idea of trust, you know, we didn't erode it. We were honest, we, we, we got the data, the team worked really hard to make it better. And, you know, honestly, I, I think we, we've had great success and we can still do better. I, I truly believe it as we're evolving through this, we're learning more and more and we want, you know, I'll even say more information more readily available. I can't tell you how many people have raised their hands to say, I want to be part of this journey. And it's all focused on making better solutions for our customers. So we're about it, bring it on, and we're going to keep continuing to build and be better for our customers. Awesome. Thanks, awesome. Ben. And I'm going to squeeze in. You're going to squeeze in one more question? Okay. Yeah, yeah just one last question. And, um, there's still quite a few, Pam, so you may need to respond to these uh, using the chat window or the Q&A. I think you can type the answers. But um, um, are you seeing a, or driving a shift in pricing models from CapEx to OpEx, and what are the challenges? We are, you know, there's always those, 
Um, we are seeing inside of you know our space, you know, capex, opex type of equations. So those are solutions that we create um, to meet those needs of those customers. Um, but as well, you know, they have different challenges, and maybe I'll just give an example. You know, where they were thinking this project was going to be this big, we've we've made the project a bit smaller, and we've worked through and created a process where they can be successful. A little bit of I think it was John who talked about, hey, I'm not going to build the whole you know, ERP, let's help them prioritize what's going to make them better now. And we worked with them to kind of, you know, pivot, listen to what they needed and bring that forward in those solutions. So we can adjust. It's not about the number. It's about what the customer needs. And that will win out every day between, you know, competitors. If you focus on the customer, you will win every day, um, hands down, regardless of, you know, all the other parameters there. So that's what we really did and we focused and listened.